Okay, good morning everyone. We will be moving forward into, um, we'll finish uh, Rule 4 with what uh, White Magic says about it, and then go on and hopefully do two more rules. Actually, one is quite short. So that might help us. Although I'm sure we can easily rank them if we just uh, do our customary work. Just a little dilation. Okay, so we'll we'll uh, yeah. And I think I better turn this thing off. It makes a lot of noise. The battery cooler. Does, does you, you don't notice it well. So well I, know, it goes off, you know. I don't know. There's one that doesn't make any noise. Yeah. Well, I, I do too, but this one really cooks them. Yeah. Fast. Yeah. How, how far is it? Uh, I can cook in ten minutes. Yeah. 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 And then if it's not a good battery, it's. Yeah. Is that charge all kinds of batteries? Yeah. Um, yes. Yes. Yeah. Okay. So no, no, only rechargeable. Yeah. Well, recharge. Yeah. But you know, there's a new kind of. Um, Battery charger that charges uh, ordinary batteries. Really? Yeah. Yes, no. yes. Right. Harold told me about this. Yes, it's, he, he recharges his ordinary batteries. Well, that's that's yeah. pretty good, huh? That would be helpful. Yeah, really helpful. I mean, you wouldn't have to buy these expensive ones either. I'll have to ask him about uh, where he gets those. But he, yeah, it's a new thing. It could be recharged, yeah. But okay, before dilating, as usual, let us. Uh, yes, yes. So I will. I'll kind of repeat the rules that we have studied, and then when it comes to the two that we'll be working on particularly today, I'll give them twice. Now let's see. Is oh, right. Okay. So we'll spend a few moments to just settle in. in the way that works best for you, abstract yourself, do abstract yourself, by whatever means, from identification with the outer person. And when you have disidentified with the threefold mechanism and its synthesis, the personality, in the way that works for you, find the soul space.
and absorb this energy of the soul, see it permeating the mental unit. build up a point of tension at the mental unit through the absorption of the will aspect of the soul. Visualize a bridge of color, colored mainly by your soul ray and personality ray colors, as if extending from the metal unit to the monastic permanent atom. and then extending to the buddhic and atmic permanent atoms, at least in visualization. as if touching the world of pure being, which for our purposes is the monadic level. And from the generated point of tension, we imagine that we hear the sound of the Om, accompanied by the word of power for your soul ray. I assert the fact, I see the greatest light, the highest and the lowest meet, whatever may be the word of power for your soul ray. A line of light flashes across the bridge. And this renders the energy of the triad accessible, at least imaginatively, and thus for the spirit.
when we think of the presence of the Great Ones, their factual presence upon and within this planet, we offer them our inner salutations, it is with wisdom, with understanding, with the light of the higher places that we seek to comprehend these rules of white magic for the metal plane. are the ones we have studied. The solar angel collects himself, scatters not his force, but in meditation deep, communicates with his reflection. Shadow hath responded in meditation deep, the work proceedeth. The lower light is thrown upward, and the greater light illuminates the three. And the work of the four proceedeth. The energy circulates, the point of light, the product of the labors of the four, waxeth and groweth. The myriads gather around its glowing warmth until its light recedes, its fire grows dim, then shall the second sound go forth. and the form blend and merge and thus the work is one. It proceedeth under the law and naught can hinder now the work from going forward. The man breathes deeply. He concentrates his forces and drives the thought form from him.
Rule 5. Three things engage the solar angel before the sheath created passes downward. The condition of the waters, the safety of the one who thus creates, and steady contemplation. The Tsar, the heart, the throat, and eye, allied for triple service. Three things engage the solar angel before the sheath created passes downward. The condition of the waters, the safety of the one who thus creates, and steady contemplation. Thus are the heart, the throat, and I allied for triple service. Six. The devas of the lower four feel the force when the eye opens. They are driven forth and lose their master. The devas of the lower four feel the force when the eye opens. They are driven forth and lose their master. Identify the aspect of the solar angel within the ego as the white magician who impels, forces, drives, initiates the creative process. And we realize that we have reached that point in our life when this angel thinks it is possible for right creativity to be pursued by the man considered as the white magician.
And so it is our responsibility to become impressed by the design which the angel intends to make to manifest. And on that general design, we ponder for a few moments. And we, as the soul in incarnation, the awakening white magician, seek to be responsive to this pattern, to reinforce it, to carry it forward according to the will of the supervising angel. realize we are training ourselves to approach the ashram and to carry forward its behest in the proper manner, in this case the white magical manner. And realizing the role for which we are in training, we thoughtfully, quietly sound the great invocation.
from the point of life within the mind of God, let light stream forth into the minds of men, let light descend on earth. From the point of love within the heart of God, let love stream forth into the hearts of men. May Christ return to earth. From the center where the will of God is known, let purpose guide the little wills of men, the purpose which the masters know and serve. From the center which we call the race of men, let the plan of love and light work out, and may it seal the door where evil dwells. Light and love and power restore the plan on earth.
Okay, we're in training. And I'm trying to be very sensitive to that part of the plan which is ours to carry forward and which is the part of the group and groups of which we are a part to carry forward. And somehow we try to give our best in all of this so that the return of the hierarchy, the emergence of the hierarchy can take place sooner rather than later. You know, the, the plans are being laid, but the timing, the time equation is somewhat intended but not yet determined. Much depends on the condition we're all in. They can't really emerge until there's a reasonable balancing of the energies we've, we've been told about that. The economic sharing, <laughs> the um, peace, some deeper understanding, some deeper understanding of the of each other. So some pretty strong, uh, some educating of the public in the possibilities, and that is emerging. But uh, amidst all the glamours as well. Now let's see. Mar, would you hit that thing? Thank you. We have a little bit to continue on, maybe more than we did on Rule 4. It's such a good rule. Yes? Mm-hmm. Yeah, well, it's just. It, it, you, you, it'll be here. Yes, yeah, it'll all be on the tape. Mm-hmm. Yeah, but I don't. There is. It wasn't written down. You know. It, it's <coughs> as it occurs. You know. The sound, light, vibration, and the form. If you go through every one of those. The, the, the manner in which he orders these depends on what book he's writing in. When he writes, and, and what kind of uh, being he's talking about. The order in cosmic fire generally is uh, vibration on the highest subplane, followed by light on the second, followed by sound on the third, and color on the fourth. And that makes a lot of sense in terms of the rays that are connected with these. Uh, factors. They're all products of vibration. So you have uh, Vulcan, let's say, on the first subplane ruling the law of vibration. And then uh, the light is connected both with the second aspect and with the third. But you have light on the second subplane, and there is Jupiter. And that indicates the monadic light the substance of all creation. Sound is certainly connected with the third ray, and we find it on the third subplane. It's the ears, it's Saturn, it's the throat apparatus. And then color, naturally related to ray four, the ray of color, and the fourth subplane. So that sequence is pretty well established. When it comes to the solar logos, he begins on the Lagoic plane with vibration and then works his way down. When it comes to the planetary logos, he begins... Uh, hi, Katie, please come in. Right. When it begins to the planetary logos, he starts on the monadic plane and works his way down. Then he skips something. We don't know what he skips. He doesn't begin on the atomic plane with any vibration. And we, you know, I think if we look at the beings that are involved there, it's some chain lord or kingdom lord or globe lord that is involved with Atma. When he comes to man, he starts on the Buddhic plane. And on the Buddhic plane, he starts with vibration and works his way down. 
plane by plane. So that's one way of considering the sequence of uh, these three. Of course, um, they're, they're given in a different order here. And in the Bible, sound comes first. In the beginning was the word. Later comes let there be light. Mm -hmm. And then comes the creation of the form through, through vibration. Which is correct? Well, I'm sure they're both correct. It's just a question of the perspective. So we'll be working with that order rather than the order that appears in cosmic fire. And uh, one thing the magician always has to have is the sense of law. The, the, the two most lawful rays are the first and the seventh. And they are also the rays of the path of initiation. When we're on the path of aspiration, it's the six and four that govern, and when we're on the path of discipleship, it's the third ray and the fifth ray which govern. But on the path of initiation, the first ray and the seventh ray govern. And even though we may not be on the first ray or the seventh ray, we're entering an age when we certainly will be able to absorb those, um, those tendencies. Um, you know, we're in this period called the withering of the law. That must be pretty obvious. Everywhere, you know, we, we're going to see around us the uprising of lawlessness on all sides. And this is in preparation for the coming of the Bodhisattva. So people like ourselves who are learning something about occultism really have to uphold this first race, seventh ray perspective. Because while the law is withering, in the Piscean sense, it must be upheld in the Aquarian sense. We have to set an example with respect to those laws, and that means, of course, overcoming our lunar nature, which is fairly lawless. It just is response, responsive to how it feels. So we have to be examples of this first ray and seventh ray, and we have to become, whatever our nature is, as pillars upholding the temple. Columns. And I suppose this has a lot to do with just our own alignment. The aligned person inevitably becomes a pillar. And a pillar is something that uh, you can rely upon. It's going to uphold that which otherwise might totter to a future fall, <laughs> to use the, the words out of a seventh ray uh, old commentary section. Um, then we're going to talk about releasing the thought form. And we won't be given the formulas for doing so, but we will be given the hint that by right breathing, we can facilitate the matter. Right breathing, right visualization. We already learned yesterday that even though we don't know everything about how to do this, our good thoughts can be effective. We just have to have confidence, and there are other ways that they can be rendered effective short of the exact formula. And, and we're going to have to do that this way too. How to release that thought form, we're going to have to do the best we can. I think for those who do the best they can, eventually the technical methods are given. But we want to make very sure that, you know, not only can we be trusted, but that we can trust ourselves when such methods are given. Because we've already proved in Atlantis, perhaps, when things were common property, that we couldn't really trust ourselves or anyone else. So now we get another chance. Drive the thought form properly. Okay. So we're going to get into what he says here in White Magic about these things. And if we can, uh, Tara, would you mind giving us a little more light? Yeah. I know that it's tough to start at 8 and end at 6 and to grind on through the day. On the other hand, um, DK assures us that we're involved in a forcing process. I think that's not unusual for any member of the hierarchy to insist that this is the case. Well, what else could be better? On a Saturday? I mean, on Saturday, what else? The beach. <laughs> 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 you know, the good place to be here. white caps, the gentle breezes, the... 18 holes. 18 holes. 36, come on. The full uh, enjoyment of all the lunar nature cherishes and holds dear. It doesn't cut it anymore, does it? No. Maybe maybe after 21 million years, or maybe for the moon chain, it's just 10 million. Maybe we're... 
Maybe we'd like to be free, you know. Maybe we're tired of the customary. Maybe something better just might be possible. Breathe a different kind of air. Yes, a little booty air, if possible. <laughs> yes, if you have something else. I have a question before you proceed. Yes. You associated Jupiter with light, Saturn with sound. Yes, and, and, and uh, well, well, you know, that's a little harder because <laughs> it's so diversified. Of course, it's a fourth rate planet. The Mercury would be involved naturally. It's, it's not the moon exactly, but moon is full of those kinds of changes which are color. And the moon is a veil and color is a veil. Yes. yes. Oh, no, no, okay, you were just reflecting. <laughs> and, of course, uh, you know, Venus, too, is a planet of art, beauty, and color. It's just amazing, even though Venus is not a fourth-rate planet, how often it just shows up on the angles or conjunct one of the luminaries of people who are involved in the arts. Yeah. So, you know, you, just, you can take theory, and then you also have to just observe and see what actually happens. Well, Neptune, Neptune is another one, and you know it's a Buddhist planet for sure. Mm -hmm. And the colors there would be very uh, sort of translucent, opaque, okay, pastel. Yeah. You know, they're not the bold, coarse colors. In a way, the fourth subplane of any plane contains a number of chakras and their contrasts. You know, and anything from below the diaphragm down, uh, Mars. Uh, uh, Earth, uh, Pluto, uh, Venus is there as well. Venus really does belong in the lower quaternary, so I'm not sure that you know it's easy to choose a planet of that type. Why Venus, if it's already achieved in five rounds, what we're trying to do in seven? That's a little curious. What is, why, how did that happen? Or, or why, why would it be in the lower quarter there? Mm -hmm. Well, it, it, it is because um, it achieved its assignment in five rounds. And its assignment is not that of a superior planet like uh, Jupiter, Saturn, Uranus, or uh, Neptune. In other words, it's a, it's a young planet relatively, although sacred, and has achieved its intended purpose in a shorter time than was expected. So, but, but, but there are more mature planets who have not yet unfolded their full assignment. Uh, in other words, Venus is like the Christ, having done everything faster. And if we carry the analogy further, we might think that Sirius is that way too, having carried things farther, faster than otherwise intended or thought. Is anything written in the works that uh, it can enable us to, I mean, I guess the whole works are, are a roadmap to help us get faster? Mm -hmm. It's love. Love. <laughs> they just pick it up really quick. It's, it's um, you know, it's love and wisdom. <laughs> they, they didn't get all tangled up. You know, and I found there's a third ray contributes to the entangling which has to be disentangled and love gets very simple so I suppose you know the, the monadic rays rays of Venus are six and two as far as I can determine six as the sub ray and two as the major ray and that's what Venus is expressing plus that clarity of mind on the fifth ray soul that uh, permits uh, of uh, a clear vision and and uh, does not incline towards um, convolution the way Mercury does. Mercury is much older than Venus. Mercury is prominent in the previous solar system more than Venus is. Mercury carries the third ray in at least two of its vehicles, I think. And Mercury uh, could contribute to the entangling. Um, but Mercury is also proceeding fast now along the way, slightly behind Venus. But, but I think there are three categories of planets, the non-sacreds. First of all, there's a category of planets about which we know practically nothing. They are um, undiscovered. We don't know whether they're sacred or non-sacred. They're just undiscovered. And some of them have been intuited by various astrologers and named astrologers, mathematicians, and psychics 
have participated in the unveiling of a number of interesting planetary possibilities. Then there are the newly discovered planets which maybe have not been um, allocated. Maybe um, Sedna is one, and uh, what's the other one? Uh, oh, you know, no, it's, um, she's the goddess of discord. Uh, and and it, it, it rather plutonic in a certain respect. Uh, it's like Xena. It's like Xena the war, you know, only only there's another name for her. And uh, it begins with an E. Eris, Eris, ah. Eris. E-R-O-S? E uh, no, no, E-R-I-S. Something like that. And it's in Eris at the moment, and it's apparently the goddess that threw the golden apple out to let the others fight over. Mm-hmm. Um, who's the fairest? Promoting discord, promoting discrimination. Okay, in, in one of the niches it was Athene. Athene, uh, yes, 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 that's true, yes. Okay, then there are the non-sacred planets that we understand them to be the Earth, Pluto, and Mars. And a non-sacred veiled by the sun and a non-sacred veiled by the moon that have not been met. Then there are planets like this, Vulcan, Mercury, Venus. They're in the middle position. They are sacred, but not as advanced as are um, the higher type of planets. Um, so the monadic ray of Vulcan, probably subray 4, monadic ray of Mercury, subray, uh, ray, subray 5, monadic ray of Venus, subray 6. And um, they, have a, they have an actual major monadic ray, too. Then comes Jupiter in a category all by itself, midway between synthesizing planets and these lesser sacred planets. He's the king of the gods, but we know he's also the son of Saturn. So he's less than some of the greater uh, synthesizing planets, but almost the equal of the sun in a certain respect a lesser sun, almost a sun, and we're told even that the sun is the eye of Jupiter. In every, con- in every solar system, there's one planet that is most like its solar logos. We have seven of these solar systems, and one of the, and each one of our major planets is most like one of those seven. I think Jupiter is most like our solar logos. And uh, we could look at certain other ones, uh, but we have not the digression now, but it's of interest. Then come Saturn, Uranus, and Neptune. Saturn, Neptune, and Uranus, these are the sacred uh, synthesizing planets who are the highest in their maturity, in their actual spiritual age, you might say. I'm talking about spiritual age here. The non-sacred planets are the lowest in spiritual age. The synthesizing planets are the highest. That's different from the degree to which they are have unfolded their program on their level. Yeah, yeah. Venus is of relatively low spiritual age, but has unfolded its program the fastest of all. Mm-hmm. Just like the Christ is younger than the Buddha. A little. You know, I mean, the Buddha, the seeds of the first solar system ripened in the Buddha. He's obviously, he's a moon chainer, and also... Uh, with reasonable inference, a representative of the previous solar system. The Christ is then separated from him by how many years? Huge number of years. Huge. You know, but, but of course, it was a provider intervening. But that yet, for his program, he has unfolded things very rapidly. And now, we are picking up the same kind of speed, we are told, as the Christ has demonstrated. And the number of his um, Lemurian humanity who are in the hierarchy now are just very shortly behind him, if you think about it. They're in the hierarchy, at least fifth degree initiates, and the Christ is a seventh degree, almost, initiate. So how much separates a fifth from a seventh degree? Two thousand years? So, you know, there are those from early Lemuria who were individualized at that time, who also made very rapid progress, otherwise they couldn't be in the hierarchy. Is St. Paul a Lemurian? My impression about St. Paul is it's a previous solar system. That's my impression. Any master 
powerfully identified with, with Judaism is from the previous solar system. That means Jesus, Moria, Paul, and Master R. Master R too. Well, is there any, any reference of uh, how many CBVs um, are at the present time? Well, you know, there there is um, an interesting thought that once a hierarchy reaches the number 63, it can get no larger and has to begin again with a new number. Either that or someone has to move on and someone has to take the place. The number 63, seven nines is uh, the maximum. Now, I don't know if that includes the three great lords or not, but we're given that number 63. So how many masters are there? I think there are that many at this time. Even Master, Master D.K. has five masters working in his ashram. He must be a pretty, you know, some people feel he's taken the sixth initiation now. Because this either can, does not make any sense if we think that we are, how many millions we are, it does not make any sense. Well, we just have, we have the, um, the statement. Made. Oh, do we mean, uh, you mean exactly that, that uh, we keep all, always in that structure certain amount and that, then that's, they that's go what I mean, right I don't know how many... He tells us that there are other, well, I don't know if he means other hierarchies, but sometimes there, there seem to be. You know, there's the trans Himalayan group. It would seem that the three great lords would be head of them all, but there seems to be an Indian hierarchy, too. You know. I'm not sure whether they are members of that. I'm sorry, out of the 63, uh, some are in incarnation and some are not, right? Well, for a master, what does it mean to be in incarnation? You have a Maya Varupa, so, so they're either in or not in, and it's, it's the same. They use their vehicle or they don't. But is that but they have one. as a total? Yeah, 63 within a hierarchy, within the trans Meaning, meaning uh, the, uh, Beyond the that, exoteric and esoteric? 63 is the number we're given. I can go, go to try to find it, but I don't really want to digress. I want to keep on the subject of time. One, one thought on that. You know, if we go back to uh, the life that the second initiation is taken in, usually the third is taken, sometimes the fourth, the fourth and the fifth. At least now. Yeah. Maybe. Okay. <laughs> in one sense, I, I can understand that it, it's like a molecule. And in molecule, there is a certain number of the atoms. Mm -hmm. In that sense, it has a structure yeah. beyond which it has to begin again, as it were. And maybe there are other hierarchies. It's difficult to say. But that's, doesn't it make sense that as we uh, grow in evolution, that there will be more? I know, I know how we move to this thing. I mean, we will move, but then that doesn't make sense that we will Well, there are going to be a large number of fifth degree initiates. So uh, he tells us actually quite a large number coming. So there would have to be some accommodation for them, I suppose. Okay, so you're saying 63 now, but there are... The 63 is, is a unit. How many units are there? That's the question. You know, there will be like this kind of... A row of the masters who just pass through time okay? <laughs> because when we rise yeah. there has to be something yeah. to accommodate uh, yeah. maybe they need yeah. more position to make room for us Okay, 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 okay. He's up here. Okay, uh, old digressing group, yes. What, what's the next uh, digressatory question? Yes. I mean, if we rise to mastership, it doesn't mean that we have to get a job in a hierarchy. We can, in fact, be a master of a sub master of a hierarchy and whatever well, work. Pretty much, uh, <laughs> pretty, pretty much the definition of uh, full entrance into the spiritual hierarchy is mastership. So, uh, I'll tell you what, why don't we put this into the unsolved category and, uh, you know, to be solved next week perhaps? <laughs> yes. Um, so, Christ is completing the program, Venus is completing the program. Is completing, is completing. What, what are the programs? 
Well, the degree, the degree of initiate of expected initiatory unfoldment. See, the the solar logos has a program. The expected degree of initiatory unfoldment is the fourth or fifth cosmic initiation in this solar system, but not the sixth. Now, for some reason, actually the solar logos would be doing very well to complete the fifth cosmic initiation. At one point it says it is expected to complete the fourth, and then it's hinted that the fifth could be completed. Um, So, you know, the time equation always seems to be somewhat in the hands of the entity itself. We we could have been with Venus. We could have been with Venus. Yes, we could have been ready. So the program for Christ was white and the program for Venus was white. Well, I don't know that uh, we're given given that. um, Let's just say that it looks like Venus has completed her second cosmic initiation and the Earth has not. However, I expect that Venus may have completed the third cosmic planetary initiation being transfigured. Um, And I also suspect that it's possible that a fourth cosmic initiation is in the program of Venus, and I don't know how close it is. I'll just give you my estimation. First premise Whatever Earth can do, Venus can do. Second premise, um, Earth is the base of the spine center of the solar logos, as we read the other day. Uh, Third statement, it is expected that the solar logos will complete his fourth or fifth cosmic initiation. Inference. To complete the fourth or fifth cosmic initiation, the solar logos will need an active base of the spine center. Next point. Our Earth, in order to be an accurate base of the spine center, needs its first ray monad activated. Its first ray monad cannot be activated unless it takes minimally the third initiation, and maybe the fourth. So now we come back to the expectation that the Earth will take at least the fourth initiation, cosmically, in order to support the fourth initiation of the solar logos, and whatever the Earth can do, Venus can do, and more. So those are the those are the thoughts that that kind of, by inference, um, unfold a picture of what the Earth might go through. But right now we're dealing with emotions. Uh, as, as if perhaps we didn't realize that um, the earth is struggling on the uh, overcoming the worst aspects of the fourth sub-level of the cosmic astral plane and is moving into the number five which will allow a mental polarization Venus has mastered that five and has moved into the six which is good So, wherever Venus has been, we have to go, and if we're human beings, wherever the Christ has been, we have to go. Doesn't he say that on the inner planes, uh, Earth has already accomplished that, it just doesn't work all the way out? He says it's a sacred planet on the inner planes, but he also tells us that it has not taken the second cosmic initiation, and he also tells us that to be a sacred planet, you have to have taken the, and now he doesn't get specific, he just says fifth initiation. Mm-hmm. So, we are engaged right now in taking the fourth of a series of seven initiations on our planet. Mm-hmm. The fifth lies ahead. And it's my thought that the second cosmic and the fifth minor might occur more or less together in the fifth round. And that would be real sacredness working out. What he means by we're already sacred on the inner, inner side I couldn't give an explanation for it in terms of these technicalities, but I just have to take it at face value. We've accomplished a lot more internally than we have worked out yet. The creative work of sound. Sound, light, vibration, and the form blend and merge. 
and thus the work is won. Before centering our attention upon this rule, it would be well to recollect certain things so that our reflection on the rule may proceed with profit. Would you like to study with DK in the same classroom? Or do you think it would be really a waste of his time? I want both yes, yes. <laughs> Double yes, okay. Uh, I, guess, I guess he's pretty unusual in taking such care to deal with people so far below his own rank and to deal personally at that, even advising them concerning their diet and other physical things. Um, it's quite unusual, I think. First, the rule we are at present considering concerns work on the mental plane, and before such work is possible, it is important to have a developed mind, a well-nurtured intelligence, and also to have achieved some measure of mind control. Okay, we have some preliminaries. These rules are not for beginners. These rules are not for beginners. These rules are not for beginners. <laughs> I'm trying to impress my mind with this thought, <laughs> or is it my brain? Uh, I guess we all realize that, you know, even though it's one of the earlier degrees of the arcane school, the real, the rules themselves are, the actual magical work of the soul section, as much as I remember from the arcane school, deals more with the other stuff in the paragraphs rather than with the rules per se. That's my memory of it. Because what are you going to do? <laughs> These rules are not for beginners in the occult sciences. They are for those who are ready for magical work and for labor on the plane of mind. So, D.K. once kicked a member of his group out of that group because he was an astral magician. He said, you have to go. Because you use the many words of the astral plane rather than the word of the soul. So, you know, we can, we can understand because maybe some of us have studied some of the other kinds of magic which are filled with all the old spells and incantations and all the rest of it, but for the true white magician, the word of the soul is uh, paramount. Love is the great unifier, the prime attractive impulse, cosmic and microcosmic, but the mind is the main creative factor and the utilizer of the energies of cosmos. Brahma, Vishnu, Shiva, Brahma, uh, is the creator. So this is creative work. And you know, when you're thinking about the third ray, which is the ray of the magician, even more than the seventh ray in a certain sense, he likes to call it uh, the ray of creative intelligence, rather than abstract or active, all that stuff. That's his best name for it, the ray of creative intelligence. When you think about Master R, you really see that. Love is the great unifier. Uh, the prime attractive impulse, cosmic and microcosmic, but the mind, the main creative factor. Okay. Love attracts, but the mind attracts, repels, and coordinates either one, all. So that its potency is inconceivable, especially in our solar system at the moment when the primordial ray, the third ray, is reaching the acme of its power much more so uh, than the third ray, uh, the second person of the, of the Trinity. He does tell us, though, in, in White Magic that, you know, we're not just supposed to use our minds because it's like a spinning flywheel. If you get close to it, it just casts you off. So people that are just involved in only using the mind, they're contributing to separation, repulsion, and disintegration. They need the attractive force of love. Is it not possibly possible dimly to sense the state of affairs and mental realms analogous to that now seen in the emotional? Whoa. <laughs> Whoa. Is it not possible dimly to see a state of affairs and mental realms analogous to that now seen? Well, what do we see in the emotional realm? Yeah. Peace, tranquility, and uh, yeah, really a chaos of desire. Can we picture the condition of the world when the intellectual uh, nature Mm. intellect is as potent and as compelling as the emotional nature is at this time, I guess that will cause some problem. Mm -hmm. The race is progressing into an era wherein men will function as minds. Think about the Aquarian age. Is it primarily an emotional age? 
Yeah. No, it's, it's, it's bringing in the fifth ray through the constellation Aquarius, and the seventh ray is a very mental ray. And that accompanies it for 2,500 years. When intelligence will be stronger than desire, well, you know, we can say the fifth round for sure, and the fifth major round, and when work is being done on the fifth chain and so forth, or in the Mercury globe of our chain. Mercury is a very powerful fifth-ray, third-ray planet. And Venus is Campomanus, Mercury is not. Okay. Well, anyway, um, and when the thought powers will be used for appeal and for the guidance of the world, as now physical and emotional means are employed, we're all said to be in the balances right now in Libra, where desire will decide which way we go. Not that the disciples are. The disciples of the age are in Scorpio, ruled by Mercury, and mind will determine where they go. But when it comes to most people in the world, it's desire. So we have to inculcate the right kind of desire in the masses so that the emotional decision made for ideals and values will be the right one. Mm -hmm. And that's what, how it's using the word appeal? Uh, yes, will be used for, yes, in other words, like, who are you going to vote for? Well, let's think about it. You know, well, I like that person. I like, I, I like Sarah. I'm going to vote for Sarah. I had a beer with Yeah. Her. 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 If you look at Ross Perot, you know, get a, a slight image of that appealing to the mind. He had his charts and his. And he got quite a bit of appeal. Yeah, he did. He did. Amazing, really. He spent a lot of money. He got some reasonable appeal. He didn't get too far, but, uh, the day may come, huh? Some people say he was crazy because he presented that way. Mm -hmm. yeah. It wasn't just the usual demagoguery, no, was it? No, you know? it was backed up by data. Now, you know, it's interesting about Obama's appeal, it was both. Yeah. It was yeah. rhetorical and intellectual, both. They had a double thing going. So, he's meaning here, if I get it right, that the power of the astral plane is unified, the mind is unified, we're going to get proper guidance mm -hmm. and appeal. Well, um, and when thought powers will be used for appeal and for the guidance of the world. Well, either good or bad, you know, uh, the illumined thought would really lead in the right direction. But if you unify the whole mental field like the astral plane is unified, you get the subtle line plus the... Plus the but you've unified the, whole, you've unified the whole astral field, let's say. Yeah. Is it necessarily good because it's unified? I mean, I, I, what I'm talking about is the direction of desire, you know, and I, I was, suppose there are a lot of selfish people in the world who reason rationally mm, yeah. that selfishness is the way to go. It really appeals to their thought, you know. So, so I, I guess what I'm saying is that he's telling us that in the era of thought power, and later he talks about the era of true personalities, hierarchy has a big thing to handle. Why do they have that? Yeah. We can see examples of that right now, you know, where some really oddball thoughts are rationalized to the degree that will accept it and believe it as they do. a way to go. They do. I, I, a lot of conspiracy theories are that way, too. Conspiracy theories. I just made such an impression on me the other night when Glenn Beck said, I want my whole pie. Yeah. Somehow I'm going to remember that. You know? <laughs> <laughs> yeah. There was a, an interesting example in Davos a couple of years ago that had some uh, economic summit. And I remember um, Bill Gates was giving a talk, and he was uh, making the point that isn't it so wonderful that by each of us pursuing our own selfish interests, the world can be made better? Something like that. Uh -huh. yeah, it's like pure capitalism. Uh, yeah, but it, I don't even know if it's pure capitalism. It's kind of. But he said that, didn't he? Bill said that. I mean, I was shocked. <laughs> wow. I mean, he may think that, but to say that in a national, uh, yeah, national it was show, really weird. Was, weird the other night when we went to see that movie and got home. Yeah. Bill Gates and Warren Buffett both were on a, a, a in a forum in one of the universities in the uh, northwest or northeast, and. Uh, to hear them talk after seeing that movie mm -hmm. you know, well, uh -huh. I mean it's well it's just a lot of things I mean the students were asking questions you know but it's the quality of their answers that I'm really talking about that caused 
Bill Gates uh, comes off as sort of a megalomaniac or something in, in some of his answers. You know, he says, megalomaniac, Bill Gates, who would? <laughs> Megalo or mental, did you say? Mental maniac or megalo? Megalo. Megalo. Uh-huh. Yeah, Buffett said, uh, there, there was a quote by Buffett, uh, something like, we're getting rich, but we shouldn't be. Yes. Uh, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> well, you know, he said he was actually talking about uh, all the people at uh, Goldman, mm-hmm. you know, mm-hmm. uh, how great they were. And, well, we're getting off into that. Better well, tonight, we're, gonna tonight, tonight we're going to do that. Tonight we're going to have the... Um, he actually said something that was directly connected Okay. Well, let's um, let's bring that up tonight. We're going to have kind of a little party here, or whatever. <laughs> Are we, oh, you don't know about that? Do <laughs> <laughs> you have an interest in it? <laughs> the, the idea was that after hours to show um, David Corton and then to have a little discussion about the movie we all saw the other night. Does that, does that fit with your schedule? Well, uh, it's fine. I was going to go for supper with Broken and Mel, but maybe I can invite them here. Yeah, sure. That would be great. Yeah. yeah. They would love to hear this. Okay, good. Well, good. There lies in this thought, um, there lies in this thought a profoundly necessary incentive for a right understanding of the laws of thought and a correct instruction to be given of the use of mental matter and the building of that matter into thought forms. In other words, I think he's trying to protect uh, what will happen when this day comes. Because if we understand uh, how to build uh, and uh, the right laws concerning this building, then perhaps some of the dangers will be less evident. the masses of humanity become somewhat mentally polarized, and the hierarchy will be well externalized in the trends, right? And they'll, they'll be here in a month. Well, you know, I, I probably. And um, yeah. everything that he, he sometimes talks about future dangers, mm-hmm. and he means in the distance, and he's talking about the mental times and the personality times, mm-hmm. whether or not hierarchy is here. So uh, what you say is correct, and yet he still has talked about these coming times when hierarchy will have a big thing to handle. And in the fifth round, yeah, hierarchy will be here, and the worst of everything to handle will emerge. They will make everything handle, uh, being done now look like child's play, you know, our present conflicts. The conflict on the mental plane will be, uh, will be full of exploding causal bodies and mental bodies. The bombs will be going off, you know. <laughs> Yes. I'm going back to where they were talking about love is the great unifier and attractor and, and um, mm. find uh, attracts your health and <coughs> I was associating that with the law of attraction and repulsion and realizing that both components are actually explicit in that law. Mm-hmm. The law of attraction and repulsion, yes. That, that's how they use the law. Love and the mind. And I'm remembering a phrase that I heard at some point, I think, when I was. And the study group, a, a phrase that just struck me so powerfully, mm-hmm. let there be love in the mind. Yes, yes. And of course, you know, the loving mind is the Venus mind. Mm-hmm. You know, that is the, 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 the union of knowledge and love, or mind and love, is under the province of Venus. And when you look at it, kind of second ray, fifth ray, you can understand that. The appreciative mind, I think that's, you know, something that Sheldon and Lena emphasize a lot. We have to build the Venus mind. We've already got the Mars mind. We've got the Mercury mind. We can attack with our mind. We can think with our mind. We can Saturn mind. We can crystallize with our mind. We can Uranus mind. We can discover with our mind. But Venus mind, to appreciate, to love with the mind, that's contemplation, to merge with that which is thought about. So you're within it, you know, and you become it and therefore you appreciate through love. In other words, love reveals. So if you have the right attitude of love with any object you're looking at, its true nature is revealed. That's the Venus part of it. How that would go. We have to develop that. Idea. Okay. Uh, these rules concern themselves with this information. The second necessary recollection is that the worker in magic and the potent entity wielding these forces must be the soul. 
the spiritual man and this for the following reason. So, you know, hey, is it us or is it the soul? Or in some way do we become the soul? Or does the soul become us? Remember these funny laws on the inner planes about the merging of consciousness. This is something we have to always keep in mind because down here it looks like we are we and they are they. But this idea of the fluidity of consciousness has to be remembered. How one thing becomes another. Or you slip out of your own meditation and become something else. This slipping in and slipping out, it's very Neptune in a way. And it, and, it, and it promotes the intuition. We have to learn how to do that. We don't want to just have chunky, concrete minds. You know, plop, plop, plop. You know. We, we, we need to be a little more fluid than that, right? I am the same. Are you, are you a fluid or... <laughs> are you a fluid or a chunk? <laughs> okay. Um, now, by the way, he calls the soul the spiritual man, but remember, the spiritual triad is sometimes considered to be the spiritual man, and in a certain way, the soul is the spiritual triad. We, we've learned that before. When the soul body is gone, the true soul is revealed. When the egoic body is gone, the true ego is revealed. We are the spiritual triad. What is the spiritual triad? It's no different from the monad. Everything is the monad. That's one thing I've arrived at. No matter who you think you are, you are the monad. No matter what, what, what level of immersion you're in, however deep it may be, your being and your consciousness is the monad. Okay. So thus, the soul or spiritual man must wield these forces for the following reasons. One, only the soul has a direct and clear understanding of the creative purpose and of the plan. Well, that's a little humbling, but okay. We have an inner advisor or a consultant. The soul, the first master we need. Someone within us knows something. That's fortunate. Okay. <laughs> Number two. Only the soul, whose nature is intelligent love, that's another way of saying Venus is the soul, can be trusted with the knowledge, the symbols, and the formulas which are necessary to the correct conditioning of the magic work. So, soul is, is uh, trustworthy. And we are not. All right, well, not yet, not yet. You know, there's just so many people. Uh, my, my friend Jeff Logie down in uh, um, New Zealand tells me about all these young magicians running around here. They've got their own communities, their own classes, their own projects. And he's kind of, you know, he's kind of the older man now. Literally. He's in his 50s. And he's kind of trying to advise all these seventh-ray types from a second-ray, first-ray perspective. And he finds it very difficult because they're so full of themselves. They're so ready to just go do things, to do magic. Let's do magic, you know, without a real deeper understanding of the implications. They are not to be trusted, and yet they love power. You know, as it says of the seventh ray, I love to see the forms emerge created by the mind and do their work, fulfill the plan, and disappear. I love power. Oh, that movement is prevalent there. I don't know. It's a, it's a Virgo, uh, it's a seventh ray country. Yeah. And, 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 and what I have understood is that when the personality ray of a country is a certain ray and the soul ray of a country is a certain ray, what it means is that souls mm -hmm. of both kinds can be found in that country. In other words, there are certain souls representing the personality ray of the country, just like in the U.S., a bunch of six-ray souls representing our six-ray personality, and certain souls representing the soul ray. It's not that when we say we in the U.S. have a six-ray soul, that that means we have all these six-ray personalities. We have a bunch of six-ray souls, and that's why we have a six-ray personality. So New Zealand has a lot of seven-ray souls in it as well as the second ray types. And, and that's our big job. You know, the, the second ray is the light carrier. So there's all these other rays that can be very potent in the Aquarian age, the fifth ray, the seventh ray, third ray, so forth. Um, they need the input of the second ray in order to act in a wise manner. 
because they're not so wise, although very efficient and very powerful, perhaps. And we have to somehow inform them so that their their action, their, their effective intelligent actions become less dangerous to themselves and everybody else. So, you know, he's saying, boy, this is a tough group to wrestle with, he's saying, because they don't want to hear what I have to say. They just want to get in there and do it, you know. Uh, you can understand. Tend to drive their actions sure, sure, absolutely. A bunch of, you know, they're young personalities full of the sense of power, not knowing what they could get into. Okay. Okay, so, and then, then further, why is it that the soul must um, wield these forces? Only the soul has power to work in all three worlds at once, and yet remain detached and therefore karmically free from the results of such work. See, if you are attached and full of desire and doing things for egoistic purposes, you are generating karma. But when you are simply fulfilling what the plan demands to be fulfilled, then you are not karmically responsible for that. Only the ego is the karmic generator, the lower ego. Okay. Why should the soul do this? Only the soul is truly group conscious and actuated by pure and selfish purpose. I'm sure we have our moments when we're so infused, when this is true. But it's a reminder as to where we are most of the time. Only the soul with the open eye of vision, presumably on its own level, I want to say, uh, on its own level, can see the end from the beginning and can hold in steadiness the true picture of ultimate consummation. Sounds like we should rely upon the soul. You know, sounds like, sounds like consultation with the soul is very important. <laughs> because it knows a lot. And if we want to uh, function with some degree of uh, what just happened. There we go. Yes, it's just how it all disappears for you. You ask whether workers in black magic possess not equal power? I answer no. They can work in the three worlds, but they work from and in the plane of mind, which they have virtually made into an independent, self-contained sphere. The thirteenth sphere. And do not function, therefore, outside their field of endeavor, as does the soul. So the soul is permeating other levels. And, and the uh, black magicians are, um, well, that should be VK. Let's see if that works. No. How about this? How about this? small moment of satisfaction <laughs> when a code unfolds into its proper okay uh, okay um, they, so they are confined in the, in the lower mind Pardon me, so the black magicians work in the lower mind that's interesting although you know they do seem to have some etheric and emotional effectiveness and their home base is called Marakara on the astral plane you know our type of black magicians that are here not on the cosmic uh, astral plane, but those that are in the cosmic physical plane have their uh, uh, place of evil on the astral plane called Mara, Ka Ra. You know, Mara is evil. It's, it's the principle of illusion that the Buddha fought. And Kara means the place of, place of Mara. Would you like to? Well, Madame Rorick went there, we are told, and told them, you guys are doomed. <laughs> Your number is had. You're going down. The warmer yeah. <laughs> she said they were very disciplined, extremely disciplined in their ranks. You know, she addressed them, told them their efforts were doomed to failure and they would be destroyed, and then walked out alive. <laughs> Not bad. Yeah. You know what I mean? Wow. <laughs> uh, Helena Rorick. How was she able to do that? I guess being a first grade soul sometimes helps. <laughs> I, 
I, I, you know, just imagine Lord of the Rings. You know, imagine in, walking into an assembly of orcs and other disagreeable types and saying those things. Maybe she just surprised them. Well, Moria would have been overshadowing her. Well, I, I guess I guess it might have been just a little protection from Master M, you know, perhaps. Yeah. I'm, I'm always astonished when I read that. Oh. What exactly is your efforts are doomed? Well, like that. In other words, you will be defeated, you will be destroyed, your efforts are doomed. Yeah. You know, there's no hope for you. Goodbye. No, I think they, they live. I think they live being uh, acutely blind. A unique blind, a unique blindness. They are uniquely blind, says DK. Or that is a unique blindness. They probably still live in hope that they can somehow just survive in their power. They're certainly acting that way today. They want to take all that power from the earlier solar system and just keep going in this solar system. And when you say they, they're the black magicians, they're the, they're black masters. Black masters. Along their own line. So she, she went to the black masters. Well, she, oh, she went to a meeting of the Black Lodge. Presumably held on the astral plane in Marakawa. Was she invited or she just crashed? I think she, <laughs> I think she crashed the party. Yeah. <laughs> but you know, they have a special discount fares now. <laughs> um, <laughs> one way. <laughs> it always feels to me like that, but that they must know and that it's just last-ditch efforts that, that they're really desperate to, you know, like the cat clung, you know, it's like, you know, we're just going to keep on going. To could, 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 be, could be hanging on the cliff. The only thing here is that they, they really won't be defeated for a number of millions of years because it's not until the judgment day that, that their real defeat comes. And that's just, you know, 300 million years from now or more. So it's in the alignment of the planets and the alignment of the, the trees and the great bear, the ultimately. Yeah. You know, she didn't do that because she had no fear. Yeah, yeah, yeah. That's how she did it. There's a secret there for us. Yes, you yes. Know? That's practice. Let's practice. <laughs> <laughs> Who is that um, gelatinous mass at our door? <laughs> yeah, well, that's right. She had no fear. And, and she had given two lives to the cause even before this one, according to the, to her own writing. You who have given two lives or something like that, you know, Moria speaking and so forth. Well, um, yeah, you know, you know the old story that when, a, when the Black Lodge members see a disciple who has no fear, they consider it a very bad sign. Yeah. Yeah. Well, that's okay. Hey. Mm -hmm. Our day will come. Who, who would do that, you say? Or, oh, oh, yeah, they would try to, sure. Because fear... They just put the fear in everybody. Well, fear That's means... That's scares them when they see somebody that... Exactly, exactly. exactly. I mean, this is personal experience. Yeah, I mean, this is... Uh, what you said? I know that from personal experience. That, that... That, when they see someone with no fear... Oh, they try... Yeah, you're right. They, they calm down. They calm down or retreat or, Retreats. you know, or... or, or because, you know, we collect them stuff. it's just like light being shined into the darkness. It, the darkness will disappear. The fearlessness being, you know, projected into the fear state. The recoil will no longer exist. They will, they'll keep, the legions of light will keep marching forward. There'll be nothing left. Well, you know, they're doomed. They're doomed. But, you know, we shouldn't hold our breath. Uh, it's possible, even after the second initiation, to veer off. So just um, none of us should count our Syrian chickens before they're hatched. <laughs> you know, we, because some probably some good people through just a slight turn of mind could go the wrong way. Okay, um, they work only from the plane of mind and they do not function uh, permeating as does the soul. They can achieve from their proximity and identification with their working materials. 
results more potent temporarily and more rapid in accomplishment than the worker in the White Brotherhood, but the results are ephemeral. And I, and I would like to say they are ephemeral, whoopsie, uh, because unsupported by principle. In other words, if, you, if the great thought power of the planet and of the solar system is creating a pattern which is out of harmony with what they are creating, it's much stronger, and their results will not abide. So, you know, you know how it is, um, if you're a machine, or if you're a human machine, if your parts are working in harmony, they'll last a lot longer, won't they? Than if they are somehow out of harmony with themselves, you'll just, friction will get you. And the friction will here destroy them, too. Okay, the results are ephemeral because unsupported by principle. I say they carry destruction and disaster in their wake. And the black magician is eventually submerged in the resolving cataclysm, which you might almost think that the earlier Atlantean debacle was a warning. You know. But a lot of those got themselves up, dried off, and began playing with fire instead of water. So the, apparently the lesson was not learned, I guess. Although I'm sure there have been dramatic conversions. I remember, did you, you ever read the um, book Zanoni by Bulwer Lytton? Yeah, Zanoni, it's a very sort of seventh grade magical book. He was a kind of a Gemini Scorpio guy, a very popular novelist in uh, Victorian England, and he wrote about uh, magical things. And there was the hero, who I guess was Zanoni, it's been a long time. Boy, that book scared the dickens out of me. You know, it, it just precipitated the whole world of demons right into your very ethers. We could read that tonight. <laughs> uh, well, anyway, anyway, there was this man who was a Renaissance prince, and he was, uh, he had a lot of potential, but he just happened to want to poison Zanoni. And Zanoni, drinking the poison, uh, kept arguing with this man that, look, you know, you have uh, real potential. You don't have to go the way you're going. And the man is waiting for results, but unfortunately nothing happens, you see. So Zanoni knows, a member of the hierarchy knows how to neutralize the poison. But there was the whole idea that this very powerful, intelligent, rather malevolent person had enough potential within him to change, to go on a different path. But he didn't. He didn't, you know. And yet the possibility always exists if just one grain of goodness exists within the causal body, we are told by Vodasky. If just one grain, you can still repent. Yes. But, but, you know, I'm just I mean, I, I know it's up to the, in between the seven and the third when that can, can still happen. And I guess if that happens, we have to totally know that that has happened. I mean, the soul, the, is, I am trying to say that there is already a degree of, of soul infusion at, at that stage. So it's not like uh, suddenly you become blind and you don't realize that you're going, you know, the, the path. And you have to, to know that. Well, you know, you can know it, but you can tell yourself another story. For instance, Alistair Crowley said that Buddha represented the Black Lodge. Yeah, because he was against pleasure. So he had, um, you know, you know. So, so, so Alistair Crowley had told himself a big story and believed he was the White Lodge and was going on the right path. See, and the great uh, perpetrators of negation. Denial. Denial. Yeah, yeah, like, like that. And, and look, uh, Blavatsky said you can wind up in the eighth sphere and still claw your way back. Okay. Yeah. She said, you know, that, that a lot of the larvae and demons and all of that have somehow made their way back out of the eighth sphere and are trying to redeem themselves. Where, where did they actually put the, the five pointed stars? start uh, going, uh, tilting downwards. Well, I think it's a decision you make on the lower mental plane. No, it, it, He doesn't really do it, does it, he? Yes, he does. does there he? is the, in, on the uh, astral plane, there is this one place where it comes the reflection. Okay. I don't know. 
Don't, do you remember that chart? It, it's something about meditation where uh, where the star comes inverts, to, inverts. Yes, because it comes to reflection, and it is on certain plane of astral plane. And I'm always thinking because there are you, you see, for instance, Osho. Osho. He also was emphasizing, oh, does he still live? I don't no, know. no, he lives uh, not. Uh, emphasizing the sexual uh, pleasures and, uh, and things. And I think that it is exactly there, where uh, um, if you have ever met the people with whom you talk, and suddenly they say totally opposite, uh-huh. reverse what you said. Have you ever met that kind of people? But I do understand that that is the technique of the Black Lodge. You have the mass and then you say the mass backwards, you know. Yeah. Things are reversed. And that I'm thinking about those powerful teachers because they say good things too and they do good work. But there is a certain thing in them uh, which is related to pleasure and to sex. What I'm thinking, which is very magical and, and powerful. Sex so magic, yeah, yeah. And it does not have to be exactly sex ma- mm-hmm. magic, but it's magical and powerful. They they can do things. They they can make things happen on this physical plane. And I think it is exactly that point. Don't you remember that? No, but I'm, I'm, I'm sure I will. I'm, I'm sure I will research it tonight. No, I <laughs> also have like a, for what I remember, one million followers uh, yeah. by by him. So, I, and it was this, and, and if you read the books, uh, you know, they have a lot of very interesting material, and yet there is a distortion right. yeah, getting yeah. into the second chakra and then right. getting into the energy. You really get into it, you can tell that. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And they don't have the discrimination to know. Well, anyway, uh, we'll try to uh, do that. Basically, if the lower mental plane is, is um, led by desire and by the physical instinct, it's a downward pointing star. If the lower mental plane is inspired by the higher mental plane it's an upward pointing star that that much you can at least symbolically justify let us therefore remember the necessity of a correct use of the mind and at the same time let us ever hold a position beyond and detached from the creative work of our minds desires and physical accomplishments i mean that's that's very straightforward obviously the position in consciousness we are supposed to hold is detached from anything we create, desire, or can physically accomplish. And every time when we do our our meditations, you know, we have our alignment, uh, I always think it's wise to begin with what a Sajjali said should be done every day, disidentify from your vehicles. And know that, you know, except in the ultimate philosophical sense, that you are not them. Every day, disidentify. Every moment, disidentify. Otherwise, you'd just be swept into the wrong belief that you are your instrument Mm -hmm. and even though we know better Mm -hmm. we're you know we we act as if we don't know better you know i mean what happened to me to me to me i feel bad you know i'm depressed you know look look, you know i i cut myself whatever it's all the myself in in the lunar vehicle it takes the keenest discrimination to act as if that is not you a detachment which still cannot be an excuse for non-participation. To, do, to be detached and still participate, this is what's required. All right. Um, now we're going to get into these four rules. We just have a little more time before we take our break. Four words stand forth as one considers rule four. First, sound. Okay, first sound. The formula or word of power which the soul communicates and so starts to work. Well, that's what's at the beginning of the soul's work, right? In other words, what the soul wants to accomplish is embodied in a formula or in a word of power, and this is being somehow communicated to the waiting magician, uh, soul and incarnation personality. (laughs) This word is dual. It is sounded forth on the note to which the soul responds, his own peculiar note, blended with that of his personality. Now, when you do your anti-corona work and you're building your link to the uh, to the triad, uh, you 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 work with a twofold bridge, right? And the twofold bridge is really sounding two notes, isn't it? It has two colors, doesn't it? Many of us are working with the primary indigo note or color, 
and then a color which represents our personality. But really, two, two notes are sounding. When you get to rule three of, of the uh, discipleship rules, dual the moving forward. The door is left behind. You know, and then, then we're told uh, that you have to sound a dual note later in rule seven which is involving the note that the masters hear and then the note that the chohans hear. So we're often working with intervals. When you sound two notes at the same time, you get an interval. Okay. The word is dual. <coughs> it is sounded on the note to which the soul responds. Now, you know, that's oftentimes, I think, the note G in the case of the second range soul. His own peculiar note. Although once DK tells us that the note G is the note of the seventh array. That's maddeningly inconsistent, except if you begin with the note A, then the note G becomes the seventh note. Yeah. You can, you know, if you begin C major and, yeah. and the, the, uh, the note G is the fifth note, the note of the soul, but if you give, begin at A minor, then the note G, which is the relative minor to, to C, the note G is then the seventh ray note. So all of this is going to emerge in this fourth ray, fifth ray, seventh ray age, which is just upon us. Okay. This is a chord, it says. We've got to assume there's some uh, non-dissonance in this chord? Well, uh, this is interesting. He's not being technical there. Yeah. A chord is three notes. Ah. Minimum. Okay. But, but, he, but he's not using, but you see, if I say to you, you're sounding an interval, well, what does that mean? If I say you're sounding a chord, you're going to get it. So he may just be using the yeah. term conveniently. Yeah. Blend it with that of his personality. Now, you know, does everyone here know your note? You know, if you're a second-rate soul, you're going to sound a G. But if you're, if you're a first-rate personality, maybe you'll sound a C with it, or a D. If you're a third-rate personality, you're going to sound an F. By the way, that's a dissonance. You know, it's a ba, you know, the neighboring notes. If you're a fourth rate personality, you're going to sound, along with your G, you're going to sound an E. See, a lot of people here are second rate souls. Yeah. If you're a fifth rate personality, you're going to sound an A, which is the note above the G. And if you're a six, uh, six rate personality, I don't know what you can do. Uh, well, it depends. It depends on whether you believe Blavatsky or see. There's a there's a peculiar combina, uh, competition between the first ray and the sixth ray. They're, they're they're difficult to distinguish. And they both use the color red. And the foundational note C, the blazing red note, can be assigned to Mars on the sixth ray, or it can be assigned to the first ray. So I I tried to find another note for the sixth ray. And I found A flat, but I don't know if I can justify it. In which case, you have a, a terrible dissonance. Um, and then if you're a seventh ray personality, you're going to sound the note B, which is bum, bum, da, da, dee. So it's a second and se a seventh ray. It's a consonant. Anyway, you can experiment with this, you know, using these notes and, you know, just start to sound one. Start, start your, start either way. Start your personality notes until you really identify with it, and then slowly, quietly begin adding your soul note. Keep the, keep the personality note going at the same volume, and then softly begin your soul note and make it get louder, and see what happens in your consciousness. Did you bring your fish back? I did. At some, at some point, yes. In the wee hours of the night, you know. Or you can do it the other way. Identify with your soul note. Keep, keep sounding that soul note till you really identify. And then introduce what might be the dissonance of your personality. So, so, so but, but, see, eventually what has to happen is not just a question of whether the notes are sounding. It's a question of how loud they're sounding. So, you know, you can have a time in your life when the personality note and the soul note are sounding with equal volume. But you can also have a time when the personality note is sounding, but it fades out relatively to the soul note. And that the question of dynamics, loud, soft, is very important in the sounding of these notes. But the, but the soul note 
soulmates to you like in three worlds. Yeah, so we're not going to completely dis... Uh, but, you know, usually the personality note is so much louder than the soul note. You know, what you really have to listen hard to find out what the soul is doing. So Libra is the point at which you have equality between the personality and the soul note. But once Scorpio tips the balance, then the personality note is a lot, it quiets down relative to the soul note. You know, and at some point, faintly, the monadic note will start to come in. And, and there are even triadal notes in between. So there's a lot of experimentation that can be done there in the language of music, parallel to the language of color. You, I mean, in other words, you could subject yourself to certain uh, colors. Simultaneously, color clashes, color harmonies, or what's a harmony for you. And, and you, could, it, you could shine one color with intensity and the other color dimly, and you can increase them relative to each other. These would all be parts of the attunement mm -hmm. of your, uh, your your inner energy being, and I think it could be very interesting. Oh, that would be a great class for Yeah. Well, you know, if only, you know, uh, who was it that said, give me a point to stand on and I can move the world? Was it Archimedes? Mm -hmm. yeah. Someone like that, you know, he, he would have a, a fulcrum or a, a lever or something, he could move the world. Unfortunately, the magicians... I'm, oh, I used the wrong word. Musicians <laughs> do not have a place to stand on. They don't know any true note. Okay, yes. You know, what I'm trying to say is if I arbitrarily choose A440 to tune my orchestra to, 440 cycles per second, and Japan chooses 447, and Bach chooses 416, Who's correct? But, you know, give me the exact note, and from that time, the exact frequency cycles per second, I'll determine everything else. But right now, everything is totally relative. There's no sense of what is absolutely correct. Now, maybe C256 is correct, and maybe you can work it out from there. But we've got a lot of research to do. And then, as someone said in the other class, and what does it do to your body? What actually does it do? What does it do to your energy system? You can say, well, this is correct, but it has this effect on you and a different effect on someone else. So we have to work out its practical vibratory effects in different energy systems to know what to use. Yeah, because everyone is in different uh, place. Exactly. According to planes, the vibrations would match. Yes, yes. Well, look, you know, it's going to be a great day when the fourth ray monad comes in. And uh, accompany that would be the powerful fifth ray mind of Aquarius, plus the will to work out all the correspondences under the seventh ray, and we will really be able to understand the artistic language which will attune the individual to his own soul or higher aspect. It's interesting because space and time are built on that same relative principle. There is no point in space, and you can measure from Everything is relative. Right. Yes, it's, it's a good point. It's a good point. It's a relative. <laughs> it's, it's just... I've always, I've always considered it pointless. <laughs> okay, I'll tell you what. Let's, we'll just take it's 10 o'clock. Let's take a little break, and then we'll come back and we'll go more deeply into this.